Hi everyone, we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. So welcome to Research Updates on Imaging and Treating Metastatic Lobular Breast Cancer. I'm Christine Benjamin, and I'm the Breast Cancer Program Director at SHARE. But before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a nonprofit organization that has been helping people through breast and ovarian cancer for the last 43 years by offering the support of those who've been there. SHARE offers many services, including a helpline, telephone and in-person support groups, and educational programs. All services are free of charge to participants. For more information, visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. And I would also like to thank our partner in collaboration, the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance, or LBCA, which advocates for IOC research and educates about lobular breast cancer. Please feel free to visit their website at lobularbreastcancer.org. So all participants will be muted during the presentations. When all of our speakers have finished presenting, we'll begin the Q&A discussion. You are welcome to submit questions during the presentation through the question pane in your control panel on your screen. The webinar will be recorded and will be available on the SHARE website um, probably within a week or two. So I'd like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Rachel Jankowitz is an Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at the Perlman School of Medicine and the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Jankowitz's clinical practice is centered around the care of patients with breast cancer. Her research focus includes invasive lobular breast cancer, endocrine resistance and hormone receptor positive breast cancer, and breast cancer clinical trials. She has served as PI and or co-investigator many breast cancer clinical trials and is an active investigator in the Translational Breast Cancer Research Consortium. Dr. Jankowitz is particularly interested in biomarker development and treatment options for patients with ILC. Dr. Gary Ulaner is an associate member in the Department of Radiology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Ulaner specializes in positron emission tomography, PET scans, and is the principal investigator for clinical trials of PET for patients with breast cancer and myeloma funded by the National Institute of Health the Department of Defense Research Programs and the Susan G. Komen Foundation. He lives in New York City with his wife, son, daughter, and he met his wife swing dancing, and they, they still dance today, albeit a little less frequently. And a special welcome to our patient advocate, Elizabeth Vigiano, who's a member of LBCA Steering Committee. She was diagnosed with de novo stage four metastatic lobular breast cancer despite years of normal mammograms. She represents the LBCA as a member of the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance and is devoted to working with researchers and clinicians to improve detection and treatment of lobular breast cancer. So thank, thank you and welcome to all of our presenters. Uh, we're going to hear from Elizabeth first. Elizabeth? Hello and good morning or good afternoon depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, really excited to have all of you participating with us today, and especially grateful to Dr. Jankowitz and Dr. Ulaner for um, sharing their insights and some of their thoughts um, about the unique challenges of detector, detecting and monitoring lobular breast cancer. Uh, the LBCA is a relatively new organization. It's comprised of patient advocates, clinicians, and researchers. Um, we are primarily a patient-driven organization that's supported by a robust and um, erudite, I think, scientific advisory and editorial board. Um, we, uh, we collaborate with uh, early researchers, clinical researchers, and patients to try to identify what some of the challenges are and find ways to address them and close the gaps between the experiences of patients and, um, and their opportunities to have good treatment outcomes. 
we have partnered with the MBC project, um, uh, their Count Me In project. They have agreed to uh, fast track and highlight specimens from metastatic lobular breast cancer patients to try to get more uh, information about the uh, genetic and genomic and treatment uh, history of patients with lobular breast cancer. Uh, we are uh, an affiliate with the MBC Alliance, which also tries to promote um, uh, awareness of um, the, some of the special concerns of lobular breast cancer patients and, um, and part of their association with the Metastatic Breast Cancer uh, Connect project. So uh, one of our uh, foundations is to not only uh, build that relationship between a clinician and a patient, but also to engage with the early researchers to try to help um, bridge what their knowledge and understanding about lobular breast cancer is and hopefully begin to translate that into clinical trials and actual clinical practice. Um, so that's our purpose. Go ahead. The one thing I do want to do is call everybody's attention to the fact that we came uh, into being as a result of the first International Lobular Breast Cancer Symposium that was held in the fall of 2016. So we've been in existence for about three years. Really excited to announce um, an upcoming second International Lobular Breast Cancer Symposium will be in Pittsburgh in 2020, 15 through 16th. Um, there will be a day prior to the symposium where we will have patient advocates um, to uh, educational opportunities. So uh, patient advocates uh, take a peek at our website and, um, and register to attend something that interests you. And, and then there will actually be um, science and biology about lobular breast cancer, the current state of lobular research. And afternoon, we'll talk about advocacy and how to advance research and how patient advocates can get involved. So ILCsymposium2020.com uh, is the place for you guys to go and get some information. And to, is there early registration, Lori? I'm not sure if early registration is up yet or not, but keep an eye on that. So I really want to uh, thank Cher uh, for supporting this opportunity for us to have the webinar for Dr. Jankowitz and Dr. Ulaner for um, developing uh, these presentations and, and sharing of their precious time with us, and especially a huge Shout out to our um, head of our LBCA steering committee, Lee Pate, for all of her dedication and hard work. Without her vision and her commitment, uh, this organization would not have come into being. So uh, I owe a huge uh, thank you to Lee. Okay, I think it's time now that we can um, change the presenter over to Dr. Jankowitz, and we will have an opportunity to hear from her. Okay, thank you very much to everyone at CHAIR and LBCA and everyone on the line for allowing me the time to speak to you this afternoon. My name is Rachel Jankowitz, and as you heard, I'm uh, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. That's a recent transition for me from Pittsburgh, but still in close touch with all my colleagues at Pittsburgh too. So thank you for your time this afternoon. So I'm gonna give you an overview of invasive lobular breast cancer in terms of what makes it unique on a patient level, a pathologic level and molecular features and then talk to you a little bit about treatment of lobular breast cancer in terms of the challenges and some ongoing clinical trials and open-ended research questions that we have. 
So invasive lobular breast cancer, which I'll hereafter refer to as ILC, is characterized by its unusual growth pattern. We call it a discohesive growth pattern, where you can see in this picture here on the screen, the tumor cells infiltrate the breast tissue in a single file pattern, a linear pattern, and that growth pattern is thought to be due to the hallmark molecular finding of ILC, which is loss of ECADherin, which is a cell-cell adhesion molecule. So Dr. it Jenkins, makes yes. I'm sorry. We could, we still see the pen medicine slide. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It's sharing the wrong screen. Then all of a sudden, um, let me see if I can move it to the other screen. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, I apologize. I'll make that a little bit larger then. That's great, thank you. Okay, can you see the proper slide now? Yes, we can. Okay, so this slide shows ILC or invasive lobular breast cancer again with the linear growth pattern in the breast tissue. This growth pattern makes it more difficult to see on mammography and oftentimes leads to it being diagnosed at later stages. Also, lobular breast cancer can have an increased tendency to be multifocal or at multiple different places in the breast and even bilateral or affecting both breasts. It also can lead to an unusual pattern of metastatic spread although ILC can go to common metastatic breast cancer sites such as bone and lung, it can sometimes spread to unusual places such as the GI tract, the ovaries, and the orbit. When we look at the, how common ILC is amongst breast cancer patients, it represents actually only 10% of all breast cancer or so. However, if you ranked it as an independent cancer in women, it actually amounts to over 30,000 cases per year. So it affects a high number of, of patients and would actually be more common than non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and melanoma if it was an independent cancer subtype. And in light of those numbers, it's actually very chronically understudied as a breast cancer sub subtype. Additionally, the incidence is increasing. If you look at breast cancer incidence rates, if you look at all cases where there is a lobular component, the incidence rate has increased 65% compared to a much lower proportional increase in ductal breast cancer, and we, we really don't know why that is. We have learned over the last several years uh, about the molecular characteristics of ILC, and the most common and important uh, molecular finding is loss of ECADherin. And that's that cell cell adhesion molecule, and that is present in over 95% of, of ILC tumors. Additionally, most ILCs are ER positive or hormone receptor positive. Uh, you can see that 95% of ILCs are ER positive compared to only about 66% of, of invasive ductal carcinomas. We've also seen alterations in the PI3K pathway, and some of my colleagues in Pittsburgh have recently published uh, amplifications in ESR1, ERBB2, and MDM4 as well as increased rates of HER2 and HER3 mutations seen in ILC tumors and FGFR4 overexpression in metastatic ILC tumors. And, and many different groups have published these findings, but some of these findings are more commonly found on tumor samples that are resistant to hormonal therapies, uh, but the loss of ECADherin is present uh, in, in even the early stage ILC tumors as well. So we're starting to see uh, an emerging pattern of molecular findings that makes ILC a unique breast cancer subtype. In terms of patient characteristics for ILC, a lot of times patients with ILC are older age compared to IDC, but that's not obviously always the case. But 
the tumors can be lower grade, more strongly hormone receptor positive, and the patients are more often postmenopausal. And commonly, these features are associated with better prognosis when it comes to breast cancer as a whole. But what we've seen with ILC is that there seems to be, despite these characteristics, an increased risk of late recurrence of disease compared to patients with IDC. So this slide shows you that for patients with uh, ILC represented by the yellow line uh, compared to patients with IDC in the blue line, and then you see on the y-axis their disease-free survival or living without breast cancer recurrence. You can see in the beginning there is a better living a better survival rate without breast cancer for the patients with lobular cancer, but there seems to be an inflection point that occurs with further follow-up where their rates of disease recurrence increase for the patients with lobular cancer after about six years compared to patients with ductal cancer. Additionally, Otto Metzger's group published that a finding of the BIG-198 trial showing differential responses to hormonal therapies for patients with ILC compared to IDC. What you can see on this slide is that when you look at postmenopausal patients treated with letrozole, which is an aromatase inhibitor compared to tamoxifen, that by and large the patients who get the aromatase inhibitor have a, a better outcome or a better tendency to remain disease-free. However, when you look at the dotted lines, which represents the patients with lobular breast cancer, there seems to be an even higher proportional advantage of getting the letrozole compared to the tamoxifen. And we don't know why that finding occurred, uh, but it raised a lot of questions about whether somehow patients with lobular cancer were responding differently to letrozole and tamoxifen compared to patients with ductal cancer. This actually mirrored some of the findings that we saw preclinically in my collaborator from Pittsburgh, Steffi Ostreich's lab. And this slide is a little bit complicated, but to just break it down, you can see that on the left, we have MCF7 or ductal breast cancer cell lines in the lab. And on the right, we have invasive lobular breast cancer cell lines. When you treat these tumors with estrogen, represented by the black line, the tumors grow uh, for both cell lines. And when you treat with tamoxifen, represented by the red, and fulvestrin, represented by the blue, it inhibits growth for both cell lines. But you can see in the lobular cell line, the tamoxifen does not inhibit growth as much as it did for the ductal cell line. In the absence of growth, uh, uh, in the absence of estrogen, in the lobular breast cancer cells, tamoxifen even seemed to promote growth of the lobular breast cancer cells. So this, com uh, coupled with the findings from the BIG-198 study, really started to raise a lot of questions about how lobular breast cancer cells may respond differently to these hormonal therapies. So right now, uh, today, we have no actual ILC-specific treatment recommendations, and I know that is a source of frustration to a lot of patients with lobular breast cancer. But we do need to keep in mind that all of these findings are, are recent, and we're trying very hard to understand them in the context of actual patient care and translate them into ILC-specific treatment recommendations. But right now, patients with lobular breast cancer are treated similarly to patients with ductal breast cancer. This really emphasizes the importance of research and clinical trials that include specifically patients with ILC. So what trials are ongoing for patients with ILC? We have two trials in the preoperative setting for patients with newly diagnosed ILC. That includes TBCRC037 and the PLOP study. And then finally, we have two trials for patients with metastatic ILC, the ROLO and GELATO trials, which I'll talk to you about. So TBCRC037 is what we call a window trial of endocrine response for women with ILC. And we designed this trial to include women with newly diagnosed lobular breast cancer who 
are awaiting their definitive surgery. So the patients are enrolled on study, and then they have the option to provide a breast biopsy or to use tissue from their diagnostic core biopsy that diagnosed their breast cancer. And while they wait for their scheduled surgery, they're randomized to either tamoxifen, anastrozole, or fulvestrin, which are three commonly used breast cancer medications. And then we collect tissue from that surgery, the tumor that is removed at the time of their definitive surgery. And really the point of this trial is to look at the tissue before and after exposure to these commonly used breast cancer drugs. One of the main things we'll be looking at is something called key 67 or tumor proliferation and growth. We expect that all three drugs will inhibit tumor growth and lower the key 67 or the proliferation, but our hypothesis is that fulvestrin will do that the most in the lobular tumors based on what we've seen in the laboratory. And the goal is to understand if fulvestrin does it better than the other two drugs, why and how. And so built into the trial are a number of correlative questions and examinations that we'll be doing mainly by sequencing efforts to look at target pathways and really learn about how these tumors are responding to the hormonal therapies. So this trial was the first prospective study specific to lobular cancer, and it really is a collaborative effort across many different institutions. All three study drugs are common breast cancer treatments, but the trial, like I said, is really aimed at studying mechanistically how the tumors are responding and we'll be doing the sequencing and pathology studies before and after, and this will be critical to inform future treatment of patients with ILC. You can see here how many different institutions are participating and how many patients each institution has enrolled. It's really been a wave of opening across all these different TBCRC sites and a true team effort, and this trial is supported by Susan G. Komen grant funding. Next, uh, the PLOP study is another trial led by Otto Metzger's group in the preoperative setting. And this trial is actually similar in some ways, uh, but the difference is that it's a full prolonged treatment in the preoperative setting for women with newly diagnosed lobular breast cancer. Again, this trial also spans multiple sites, which is necessary a lot of times to do a trial for lobular cancer because of the lower frequency. But the trial has two phases, a window phase, which is similar to the TBCRC037 study, looking at the effect of letrozole versus tamoxifen for a short time, for two weeks. Again, they're looking at the same key 67 proliferation or tumor growth as, as a surrogate of, of response. And then the trial will go on to look at the pathologic complete response rate of hormonal therapy alone or in combination with palbociclib uh, for patients, all the patients on the trial with hormone positive breast cancer. Next, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the two trials that are going on in the metastatic setting for lobular breast cancer. Dr. Alicia Okinas was kind enough to give me an update on the ROLO trial, which is a trial looking at a drug called crizotinib in ECADherin negative lobular breast cancer and diffuse gastric cancer. So if you'll recall, um, loss of ECADherin, the cell-cell adhesion molecule is the hallmark finding of, of lobular cancer. And it also happens to be present in diffuse gastric cancer. So their group has shown that small molecule inhibitors of ROS1 elicit something called synthetic lethality in ECADherin defective breast cancer cell lines and also have decreased tumor volume in ECADherin deficient mouse models. So the trial is looking at treatment of patients with metastatic lobular breast cancer or diffuse gastric cancer and is treating the patients with crizotinib and fulvestrin, another commonly used hormonal therapy for metastatic hormone-positive breast cancer, and the trial is going to have, it, it has optional biopsies built in at the time 
of progression and two weeks to try to learn how the tumors respond to this treatment. And that trial is ongoing and I believe currently has enrolled about five out of a planned 29 patients. Next, we have the gelato study. Um, and this study is looking at the combination of carboplatin, a chemotherapy drug, in combination with atezolizumab, which is an immunotherapy. Atezolizumab is a drug that basically um, binds PDL1 and it releases uh, an inhibition of the immune system. So it basically works to allow the immune system to work better. And this trial is looking at this combination because, as you may recall in the TCGA analysis of lobular cancer, there were three different molecular subtypes within ILC, and one of them was the IR, or the immune-related subtype, based on the TCGA analysis. And that subtype had more infiltration of lymphocytes or immune cells, and they saw a strong effect of platinum drugs uh, in preclinical studies. Um, and so that led to the design of this combination for this trial, um, but still a lot to learn about what that means in terms of actual patients. So we'll look forward to the results of this study. So in conclusion, ILC has unique patient pathologic and molecular characteristics and the incidence is actually rising compared to IDC. There's a critical need to understand response and resistance mechanisms to hormonal breast cancer therapies in ILC tumors and why there is an increased risk of late recurrence compared to IDC. So these ongoing trials, both in the early stage and the metastatic setting, will be critical to inform biomarker identification and development of ILC-tailored treatments in the future for our patients for this uncommon breast cancer subtype. I uh, have worked with a lot of people um, at Pittsburgh and across the Translational Breast Cancer Research Consortium, and I look forward to joining the group at Penn here now to continue this work, and there's too many people to thank all at one time, but um, a special thanks to TBCRC and Komen and all of you for listening today. Thank you. Dr. Ulaner? Great. Shall I begin? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So my name is Gary Ulaner, and I want to thank uh, Cher and the uh, Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance um, and uh, the uh, people who have joined us today for uh, their, their interest and support for research in lobular breast cancer. I'll be talking about imaging of lobular versus ductal malignancies with an emphasis on, uh, on PET-CT. Uh, I disclose uh, research support, as well as I disclose that I believe in uh, starting imaging education early. Uh, this is my, my son, Ilya, uh, who's already to uh, be able, able to recognize the liver and the spleen. And uh, my daughter, Annabelle, who I swear uh, when I put uh, 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 images up on a screen, that is the, that is the best way to, uh, to soothe her if she's crying. Right. So. As an overview, uh, there's, I think, a big difference in imaging when you're talking about looking at the local disease versus looking at systemic disease. So people may ask, what is the best imaging modality for breast cancer or for lobular breast cancer? And there is no one best imaging modality. Uh, uh, you need to identify what your particular uh, uh, goal of the imaging examination is. For evaluating disease within the breast, mammography, ultrasound, and MRI uh, are and have been uh, the gold standards for evaluation of the local breast malignancy uh, uh, for quite some time. Now, 
I think we all recognize that all, on all three of these modalities, lobular breast cancers are more difficult to detect than ductal breast malignancies. And this is why uh, uh, lobular breast cancers may grow to a larger size before they're detected because they're harder to detect when they're, when, when they're smaller. Uh, despite that, that the lobulars are harder to, uh, to evaluate, the evaluation of mammograms, ultrasound, and MRIs is in effect equivalent for uh, patients with ductal and lobular uh, malignancies. Mammograms, uh, uh, we're looking for masses, calcifications, and architectural distortion, and the same findings that you're looking for in ductal breast malignancies, you're looking for in lobular breast malignancies. But we recognize that the lobular breast malignancies um, uh, 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 are harder to find, and all three of these imaging modalities are less sensitive for detecting lobular breast cancer than ductal. For systemic staging, which means looking for the distant metastases in breast cancers, there are two prevailing uh, strategies. One is CT and, and bone scan, uh, whereas the CT provides good evaluation of soft tissues and the bone scan is used to, uh, uh, for uh, evaluation of, uh, of osseous malignancy. And the second is uh, uh, FDG PET CT, which again uses the same CT component, sometimes without intravenous contrast, and uses FDG PET in lieu of the bone scan because, the, uh, as I'll show you, the FDG PET can be more sensitive, not just within the bones for the bone scan, but can also help you pick up disease that might be overlooked upon the C uh, on the CT. So talking about our standard PET-CT, which is FDG, FDG stands for fluorodeoxyglucose, uh, 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 which is really, in essence, a, a sugar molecule, uh, which we've labeled with something so that now we can see where the sugar molecule goes. Um, and when we uh, administer the sugar, uh, the radio-labeled sugar molecule into patients, where it accumulates, we can see foci on the, on the PET scan and show us where that sugar is going, and we can uh, recognize which uh, foci of accumulation are probably benign or probably malignant. So here's a little graphic representation of stage in malignancy. First off, for patients who are, have thought, they're thought to have local disease, advanced local disease, and in this case, we can see the malignancy within the breast on both the CT as well as the FDG PET. Here is what we call a maximum intensity projection image. So we can see uh, the whole body. We also sometimes call this a spinning person image, where you can see where the uh, avidity is supposed to be, like the brain and the heart, and where the avidity is not supposed to be, like here in the breast, which we can see here. And there's a focus that pick, was picked up uh, down in the pelvis, and then corresponding to the CT scan, we can see that's within an osseous structure. So this is suspicious for an osseous metastasis on the FDG PET, and on biopsy, this turns out to be an osseous metastasis that otherwise would not be detected. I show the comparison bone scan in this patient to demonstrate that that focus that we can see on the FDG was not picked up on the bone scan, all right? So while many institutions and the current N, uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Center uh, recommendations for systemic staging of breast cancer is currently CT and bone scan, there is a large and growing uh, amount of evidence demonstrating that the FDG PET CT uh, will, is more sensitive in picking up uh, disease than the CT and bone scan. A number of really nice publications have demonstrated that based on the in initial stage uh, of the locally advanced breast tumor, up to 30% uh, of patients um, uh, 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 may have metastatic disease, which is not known about until they perform the FDG PET-CT. So the detection of that disease at the initial diagnosis allows patients to be properly staged and to uh, get the proper uh, 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 treatments. Because if you're metastatic, you want to be getting the metastatic treatments. 
rather than uh, uh, the, lo the local treatments, which are uh, include surgical therapies and aggressive systemic therapies that, that, that may not be needed. Um, some excellent work from Memorial Sloan Kettering um, demonstrating that in patients who had the FDG PET CT as well as CT and bone scan, when there was discordances between what the FDG PET CT and the CT versus bone scan said whether there was or was not malignancy, and pathology was available to confirm the truth, the FDG PET was, at least in this study, always right as compared to the CT and bone scan. So here, I think there is a substantial evidence that our FDG PET CT uh, is going to move more and more towards supplanting CT bone scan for the evaluation of breast cancer patients in general when you're looking for distant metastases. And at Memorial Sloan Kettering, when I joined 10 years ago, all metastatic breast cancer patients were evaluated by CT and bone scan, and today the vast majority are being evaluated by FDG PET. And it's not just for the detection of the metastases, but also for the tracking of the metastases as you're responding to therapy. Here's our CT scan from a baseline and follow-up evaluation. And this patient, unfortunately, has a, 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 a substantial burden of malignancy, which is represented by these sclerotic or, or white areas within the bone. We can see that nothing has changed from the baseline to the follow-up uh, scan uh, after therapy. But when we look at the FDG PET scan, you don't have to be a radiologist to see that the volume of disease shown in red here has greatly increased. Um, on the follow-up examination, and this patient is not responding to therapy. Does the FDG, these changes in FDG PET make a difference to patients? And indeed it does. We uh, often tr track uh, 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 these survival curves where we're looking at the patient uh, percent uh, of either disease specific or overall survival on one axis and the time uh, um, after the initiation of the study on the second axis. And we can see if you're using CT and bone scan, there indeed is a difference between patients who respond on CT and patients who don't respond on CT and bone scan. So here's the, uh, your difference. If you're responding, you have a better survival than if you don't respond. However, then we look at the difference between a PET responder and a PET non-responder, and we can see that the FDG PET substantially better uh, predicts patient outcomes uh, 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 while on therapy than, than, the, than CT and bone scan. So I like to present this little slide talking about where is their clinical value for patients with breast cancer in general, and in locally advanced diseases like stage 3 ABC, about 30% of patients will be upstaged stage 4 after an FDG PET, and this can make a tremendous difference in the way patients are are, are, are uh, 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 staged and treated at diagnosis. And then for patients who are stage four, there's evidence that the FTG PET is more accurate than the CT and bone scan in evaluating treatment response. And of course, you want the most accurate evaluation of whether you're responding to therapy. For less advanced disease at, at diagnosis, um, I don't think there is enough uh, data yet to suggest um, uh, but there, it, there is some rate of, of finding disease that was unsuspected before the FTG PET scan. And in lo, uh, the, lo, uh, uh, the earliest uh, stages of disease, there's been no uh, uh, added value in, in, in using FTG PET CT. So we've already seen this slide. Every, uh, this is a, a landmark paper in the field of lobular uh, breast cancer where uh, uh, it was confirmed uh, really conclusively demonstrated the, the molecular genetic differences between ductal breast cancer and lobular breast cancer. And we've mentioned a real main difference is in his gene CDH1, which encodes for e cadherin and this is absent in the, in the uh, almost all, if not all, uh, um, uh, lobular breast cancers. And this makes a difference um, uh, in the breast morphology um, and how they're imaged. Uh, uh, and as uh, uh, Dr. Jankowitz was showing, even how they may respond uh, to therapies. So on CT and PET-CT, let's take a look at an example patient. Um, 
uh, where you see the normal activity in the brain, in the heart. These are the kidneys. This is the colon. This is the bladder. There are no abnormal FDG Abbott foci in this patient. However, if we look at the CT, we see those what we call sclerotic, the white areas within the bone that shouldn't be there in a normal patient. So are, are these a problem or are they not? Um, uh, these little white areas can occur in a benign uh, um, uh, process called osteopoikilosis, um, and they can also occur with metastases. So uh, uh, a number of, well, I think, you know, older school pet interpreters, people who interpret pet, look might look at this and say, well, there's no FDG avid malignancy, therefore these are benign. But as we can see from this patient's uh, prior images, these osseous lesions are new since the diagnosis of their breast cancer, and these are non-FDG avid metastases. So these are metastases that show up on the CT or here on the MR, but not on uh, 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 on the FDG PET scan. Something to be uh, uh, to be wary of. Uh, Another example, here's a patient in 2009 in which there were no osseous lesions. In 2011, despite no FDG avidity, there's a new sclerotic lesion, that white, white lesion within the bone. This represents a biopsy proven osseous metastasis that uh, is picked up on the CT but not on the FDG PET. And this is not um, just within the bones. Um, as Dr. Jenkowitz mentioned, lobular breast cancer uh, unfortunately metastasizes to some uncommon areas like uh, more commonly like the GI tract and the peritoneum. Um, here we can see uh, on the CT scan, this area that I'm outlining here is fluid within the the abdomen, which shouldn't be there. And this is the stomach wall, which is greatly thickened. And again, there's no FDG avidity that's abnormal on the PET, but these CT findings are highly suspicious for abnormal process. And this upon biopsy is widespread lobular breast cancer. So when you're dealing with uh, FDG PET CTs, I think it's important for people to realize that the FDG PET is less sensitive for lobular breast cancer than ductal malignancy. And we know that there are a diff there's a different propensity for the sites of metastases between lobular breast cancer and ductal breast cancer. And both of these make lobular breast cancer sometimes hard to see on FDG PET CT. Uh, I, we should also note that the lob, uh, osseous bone metastases in lobular breast cancer are almost always sclerotic, whereas in ductal malignancies, they're more commonly uh, uh, lytic, sclerotic being white and lytic being more absent or not, or, 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 or not white. So here's my little warning on your FDG PET CTs. If you're, for the people who are interpreting them, you have to be aware that lobular breast cancers are going to be harder to pick up on FDG PET CTs. So what if you're the patient? What do you do? Well, my advice is, and what I like to tell my trainees, is that every lobular breast cancer deserves one chance at being FDG avid, because actually the vast majority of them are avid. I would say at least 70, 75 percent of lobular breast cancer, the metastatic disease is avid and can be well seen on FDG PET CT. You just have to be cognizant that there's a substantial minority of patients where you have uh, the disease seen on the CT but not on the FDG PET. Um, and then you have to be, you really have to scrutinize the CT images for any evidence of malignancy um, uh, 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 and not rely upon the FDG PET for, for finding the disease. If I can take a few moments, I'd like to talk about uh, what is now the future of uh, PET and molecular imaging uh, not, uh, for lobular breast cancer as well as other malignancies. Um, and instead of using FDG, which is our sugar, 
um, uh, in recent years, we're developing specific pet tracers that go to one target on a cancer cell. So this might be the estrogen receptor or the progesterone receptor or the HER2 receptor or the androgen receptor, which is found on a number of breast cancer uh, 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 breast malignancies. And using molecular imaging, uh, we can perform a whole body non-invasive evaluation of which patients express which of these uh, uh, targets so that we know, ah, this is the patient population that we should tar use medicines that go against target one, and this is the population that we should use medicines that go against target four. For lobular breast cancer, um, some of these uh, uh, agents that are in development, one uh, is called uh, flucyclovine, which is an amino acid tracer, uh, which there's some evidence where we can see uh, uh, uptake within breast malignancies that may not be FDG avid. And one of my favorites right now is estrogen receptor um, uh, uh, targeted imaging. Um, as Dr. Jankowitz mentioned, lobular breast cancers, uh, 94, 95% express the estrogen receptor. So if we can target the expression of the estrogen receptor by finding something that binds to the estrogen receptor, we may have a way of sensitively detecting lobular breast cancer. Here's a comparison of, of one patient uh, uh, we uh, have, uh, have seen um, in which the FDG PET, again, this is that maximum intensity image, um, uh, uh, did not show the malignancy, but the estrogen receptor targeted imaging was able to show the primary malignancy as well as multiple nodal metastases and an unsuspected focus within the chest, which happens to localize to the bone. And this is a biopsy proven osseous metastasis, changing this patient's staging from a locally advanced disease to metastatic and diagnosis at diagnosis, which dramatically changed their approach to management. So this is, this is not standard. It's something that uh, I'm hoping within the next couple of uh, uh, years will become more prominent. So talking about imaging, particular PET CT for patients with breast malignancy, I think uh, uh, it, it's becoming more and more widely known that FDG PET CT is useful both for patients with locally advanced malignancy and for patients with metastatic breast cancer because it gives a better evaluation of the malignancy than CT and bone scan in most cases. However, for patients that have lobular breast cancer, a certain percentage of those patients are going to have metastases that are not FDG avid. Again, I like to give every breast malignancy the chance of being FDG avid, so there's no harm in performing one FDG PET scan in the appropriate scenarios. And then if it is FDG avid, the disease can be tracked by FDG PET CT, and patients and, and disease that's not FDG avid can be tracked by CT and bone scan. And then just as a note for the future, there are multiple new radio tracers that are being evaluated specifically for patients with lobular breast cancer, as well as for multiple other malignancies, but these are still only in development. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much for a great presentation, two great presentations. Um, let's take a look at some of the questions that came in. So one question about the FDG PET scans. Do most institutions offer this type of a scan and are there any downsides to it? Uh, 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 FDG PET CT is available in most, uh, um, uh, uh, let's call them tertiary care centers. Um, so small, practices might not have them, but most major hospitals uh, uh, have an FDG, excuse me, have a PET-CT camera that they can do FDG PET-CT 
uh, scans on. Are there any downsides? There are downsides, unfortunately, to everything, but um, in my opinion, the downsides for the FDG PET-CT inappropriate patients are, are minimal. Um, I've heard um, uh, 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 there, there's, there's this concept in, in radiology right now to use the least amount of radiation exposure, which is, of course, the goal in, in all scenarios. And every test has some radiation exposure. And the FDG PET CT has more radiation exposure than a, a CT alone. Um, that being said, the amount of exposure is so small that I think it tends to get talked about a lot more than it really needs to be. If you have a, mal a serious malignancy like breast cancer, um, uh, to me, I'm more concerned about getting the right diagnosis for individual patients than I am with the small theoretical risks that can be associated with radiation. Again, we try and minimize radiation as much as possible, um, uh, uh, but in this case, I think the benefits uh, outweigh the theoretical risks. So radiation is one potential drawback. Time is also a potential drawback. Every test that you do in some way del can delay your therapy, but the FDG PET scan can be performed on one day and therapy initiated on the same day. So again, while there is always always a downside to anything that you can mention, I think the downsides of the FDG PETs are 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 small um, as long as you're using them in the appropriate patients, right? Don't use FDG PET scans in patients with stage one breast cancer. There's no value. Right. So a couple a question about going back uh, to earlier in the presentation about the Rolo and Gelato studies. Uh, do you need to have any specific mutations like PDL1 or ROS1 to enroll in either study or to be eligible? Yeah, the ROLO trial eligibility, uh, basically, um, my understanding is that you just have to have ECADherin negative metastatic lobular breast cancer, and you have to have had previous treatment with at least one chemotherapy and at least one hormonal therapy for advanced disease. There's no eligibility um, b beyond that that, I, that I'm aware of. Um, and obviously, each individual patient would have to be checked because uh, there's always certain exclusion criteria. But that's the main eligibility. Um, in terms of the gelato trial, and I'm speaking on I am not an investigator on either of these trials, so I'm, I'm just telling you what I know, um, that you have to have metastatic lobular breast cancer. Again, you have to have had progression on prior hormonal therapy, and uh, you cannot have had more than two lines of prior chemotherapy for gelato. And that is, uh, to my knowledge, I don't think there's any necessity for having PDL1 or PD1 positivity that I know of, but that would have to be checked with the investigators. And for both of those trials, you have to have measurable disease, which brings us back to the imaging conundrums that many lobular breast cancer patients find them in. Right. Um, so uh, I can address the issue of measurable disease um, uh, we actually just published a manuscript in clinical cancer research um, discussing using FDG PET-CT to help identify patients who don't have measurable disease on CT. Um, the measurement on CT is usually done by something called a resist, um, and in uh, FDG PET-CT, they have a cute name, persist, <laughs> right, for, for pet resist. Um, uh, and there are uh, um, uh, patients without measurable disease on CT slash rhesus because bone lesions in general are not measurable um, uh, in rhesus that you can see the lesions on FDG PET. And uh, we are 
uh, promoting using uh, FDG PET here as a mechanism for identifying um, uh, measurable lesions that otherwise would uh, uh, prevent patients from getting on clinical trials. So that may that's a particular note directly for for Dr. Jankowitz when you're design, designing these wonderful trials. Uh, uh, keep FDG PET CT in your armamentarium to help get patients on them. So a couple of people are asking if they've been having bone scans every three months, should they be asking for an FTG PET next time? I don't think there's any uh, 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 imperative to do so. Um, in general, um, if you are asymptomatic, for example, you've, you've had breast cancer, um, you're treated, uh, you're well treated, and you're now asymptomatic. Actually, the guidelines all say that you should not have any screening examination, CT, bone scan, FTG, PET CT. Um, they should be used for when there is suspicion due to a sign or a symptom of recurrence. That being said, I know a lot of people um, have periodic uh, screening examinations for recurrence of malignancy every six months or, or every year. Um, uh, there's little evidence to demonstrate that that study will, even if it finds disease, improve outcome. Uh, so I, I don't recommend it to any of the uh, uh, clinicians I work with or the patients that I, that I speak to. And then therefore in that global assessment, if you're getting screening bone scans, um, which, you, which haven't been shown to help, uh, you don't need a screening FDG PET CT. Now, if you have a sign or a symptom of recurrent disease, bone pain, uh, uh, for example, um, then I, there is evidence that the FDG PET CT is more accurate and more sensitive for detecting what is the source of that recurrence than CT bone scan. So if someone says, I have new pain in my hip, what do I do? I say, well, after your x-ray of your hip, um, if you're going to get a systemic staging, get the FDG PET CT. If someone says to me, I have breast cancer, um, I'm getting bone scans every three months and it hasn't shown anything, uh, there's no reason to get the next FDG PET CT and for that matter, probably no reason to get the next bone scan. So there's a question about circulating tumor cell tests for detecting metastatic ILC. Are they reliable, unreliable, are they often used, or not? So I, I could field that one. Circulating tumor cells are prognostic for patients with early stage breast cancer. In other words, in a research setting, it's been shown that if they are present, patients are higher risk of developing metastatic disease. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so, in other words, they help. They can tell us about prognosis, but they are not used to be a detection tool uh, right now for metastasis. And that's because there may be patients. Uh, there are patients we know that have circulating tumor cells at the time of their original diagnosis, and once they go through their definitive treatment for early stage breast cancer. It's not FDA approved or part of our routine clinical workflow to to check for CTCs at this time. And, and this is a huge issue that we've struggled with in the breast cancer community and the subject of many ongoing conversations in the setting of clinical trials to figure out a way, could we somehow track CTCs or even circulating tumor DNA um, to identify patients who are higher risk of recurrence and, and then do something about it. Um, but what we normally do to prevent recurrence is put people on hormonal therapy. And so the question is, well, what would we do differently? Uh, you know, would patients that have CTCs present five years later do longer, or would we add a, dr a different drug like palbocyclib? And but that that is all the subject of ongoing 
clinical trials and conversations and, and not yet a standard of care, unfortunately, because we don't have a great answer about what to do about it if we find them. And our last question, since you mentioned uh, hormonal therapy, so a couple of people are asking what's the optimal duration for adjuvant hormonal therapy for IL? So the optimal duration of hormonal therapy uh, is an, another complicated topic, depending on whether the patient was premenopausal or postmenopausal when they were diagnosed. Um, I favor longer duration hormonal therapy in patients who are diagnosed at a premenopausal age. Um, the data about using more than five years of an aromatase inhibitor for a patient who's postmenopausal at the time of diagnosis is uh, a complicated one, um, and I tend to take that on an individual case-by-case -case basis depending on the level of risk the patient had with their primary breast cancer. And, and I must say, uh, lobular histology does cross my mind when I make that decision knowing that they potentially could have an increased risk of late recurrence, but there's no universal answer to that, that question at this time. It's, it's an individual patient and doctor decision. So I think we're out of time. A very big thank you to Dr. Jankiewicz, Dr. Elaner, the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance, Elizabeth Laurie. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. If you wouldn't mind just taking a moment at the end of the webinar to fill out the survey, it helps us to uh, inform future programming. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.